Ladies and gentlemen, children of all the ages, we are now in the sixth part of what is surely to be my magnum opus project, which is reviewing every single Looney Tunes cartoon from the classic era. I don't really have anything to say here in this intro, so let's just get into these next 100 reviews. Crowing Pains here we've got the return of the dynamic between Foghorn, Henry, and the dog, only this time Sylvester is added to the mix. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why the barnyard dog is even in here, since he doesn't really contribute all that much, and his inclusion can make this one feel a touch overstuffed. Although I guess his presence was worth it just for this hanging bit. This is pretty standard, above-average Foghorn Leghorn material, albeit with a really mean-spirited and funny ending punchline that helps elevate itself. A Pest in the House. Another Looney Tunes cartoon that makes you feel the pain of being dead exhausted, not being able to rest, and the pain of having to deal with complaints of customers because of your fellow employees' incompetence. Sometimes the Chug Jones cruelty and pessimism just works wonders. Although I will admit it is a little convoluted that the guest would go downstairs and punch Elmer every single time his rest is interrupted instead of socking Daffy. You know, the one that's actually making the noises keeping him awake and is right there, but it still works just fine and does produce some genuinely funny bits like this phone punching gag. The Foxy Duckling. A rather bizarre chase cartoon that, for some reason, starts off with a good solid two minutes of establishing that the fox has insomnia, because the fox in the short doesn't want to eat the duck, he wants to use the duck's feathers so that he can put them in his pillow so he can sleep. I don't understand why that change was made to the formula. Anyway, this one's got a few good gags, like this rope gag, but neither the fox nor the duckling have very strong personalities. House Hunting Mice Feels like a quasi-remake of Doggone Modern, only this time with Hubie and Birdie instead of the two curious puppies. And even though I wasn't that big of a fan of that one, the two curious puppies seem like a better fit for this kind of cartoon than Hubie and Birdie. The talking in this one does it absolutely no favors. This one's just not that funny, not even that amusing, really. Little Orphan Airedale. A remake of Porky's Pooch, this time with the official first appearance of Charlie Dog. Now, this one's not quite as zany as Bob Clampett's original cartoon, but it is a hair crueler, which I think makes more sense for this kind of cartoon. And on top of that, it is paced just a little bit better. Dog Gone Cats. I don't think these cats thought this plan through. Sure, I guess they're just trying to get even, but they do realize that as soon as that package is delivered that he's going to go right back to beating the stuffing out of them, right? probably even more so than he already was. Not really a ton of great gags in here, but, you know, I did like this bridge joke. Slick Hair. This cartoon partially works as a satire about the entitlement of rich celebrities. Now, whether or not that was intentional is up in the air, but the subtext is there. Anyway, this one's got a few good Hollywood parodies, one of the better ones since Hollywood steps out. This one's got a few good, solid, energetic moments, and the ending is... definitely something... Probably something adult, but definitely something. Mexican Joyride. Daffy Duck is always a delight to watch. Watching Daffy Duck as both the ignorant American tourist and then the screwball in the ring with the bull are both equally fun. Catch as Cats Can. Another mild chase cartoon, with the only thing that's done to elevate this one is that another bird is egging Sylvester on into actually trying to kill another bird. The idea for that is a lot funnier than the actual execution. The gags are alright, but nothing outstanding. And, yeah, I can see why that parrot wanted to kill the Frank Sinatra bird, because he never shuts up. A Horse Fly Flees. Bob McKimson's take on Bob Clampett's old cartoon in Itch and Time. So, yeah, obviously this one's inferior. And I honestly have no idea what the horse fly is even doing in this cartoon. He doesn't do anything. And unfortunately, nobody really suffers all that much to make any of this funny, least of all the dog. Gorilla My Dreams. Not great bugs, especially for this time era. The section where Bugs fights with Gruesome happens way too late in the cartoon. 
There is some interesting satire about domestic life early on in the cartoon, as the whole relationship between the gorillas is analogous to a sexless marriage. But after the opening bit, it's not really explored again. And then once the seven minutes are up, the cartoon just stops without much warning. This one has several good ideas in here, but none of them are really allowed to fully bloom to their fullest potential. Two Gophers from Texas. Okay, the Goofy Gophers are a lot better this time around. Their personalities are a lot more well-defined here, and their dialogue is a lot funnier. It helps that they're actually in the moral right this time around. The dog is a fantastic antagonist, giving us some truly deranged pieces of animation. And there's no reason for him to be this overly theatrical, but it just works. And the slapstick is just fantastic. File this one under, how did I not know this one existed beforehand? A Feather in His Hair This one was likely made to try to recapture the success of Hiawatha's Rabbit Hunt, only the Indian antagonist is nowhere near as entertaining of a character. I did greatly enjoy this arrow gag, and this ending gag of Bugs fathering so many children is genuinely hilarious. Shame the rest of this cartoon is so... meh-ish. What makes Daffy Duck? A fun twist on a classic formula. Also, I don't know why, but I love at one point the fox manages to get himself knocked out, and Daffy and Elmer do their thing for about a minute, and then we return to the fox, who is still completely knocked out cold and has to be woken up by Daffy so that he can continue the chase. Lots of several laugh-out-loud moments, and another often-overlooked cartoon. What's Bruin, Bruin? I think it's safe to say that most of the members of the crew suffered from chronic insomnia and wanted the audiences to feel the pain that they felt. The three bears are more fun when they're working off of each other, but this is largely just Papa Bear's story, and he's by himself for a good half of the cartoon. Now, the opening card gag was good, as was this nail gag, but this is otherwise just a safe, predictable cartoon. Daffy Duck slept here. This is more or less the exact same premise as the previous cartoon, except with Daffy and Porky instead of the three bears. And this one is also much funnier, mostly because the characters here are much better suited for the plot. This one's a real classic. A hick, a slick, and a chick. A much less funny version of Blue Cat Blues. And yes, I know that cartoon wouldn't come out until eight years after this one, but my point still stands. Also, I genuinely don't know if Elmo and Daisy Lou were supposed to be dating or if he was just trying to woo her. But either way, she's clearly not interested in the main character and is actually quite shallow, so I don't know why we're supposed to be rooting for him to get together with her. Back Alley Uproar. This is a remake of Frizz Freeling's own cartoon Notes to You, and this is a massive improvement. It benefits from replacing the generic cat with that of Sylvester, and Porky with that of Elmer. This one's crueler, funnier, the comedy's punchier, and the pacing is greatly improved. Also, the ending is a much meaner and far funnier ending punchline than the original cartoon. Genius stuff. I Taw a Putty Tat. Another try at tackling the Sylvester and Tweety formula, albeit taking direct inspiration from Puss and Booty, which is obviously a much better cartoon than this one, if for no other reason than the original's ending punchline is so much better. But honestly, this is still pretty good stuff. Tweety's sadistic personality has been toned down yet again, but I would argue it's still in here. It's just hidden under a veneer of him pretending to be stupid, but that's just my take. The image of Tweety putting the dog in the birdcage right alongside Sylvester and then putting the blanket back over it just to give them some privacy will never not be funny to me. Rabbit Punch After two low-tier Bugs cartoons, it's such a relief to get another fun one. Taking obvious inspiration from Baseball Bugs, and while obviously not as good as that one, this is still a great cartoon. It's actually interesting, once again, to see Bugs actually struggling more with an opponent rather than just walking all over them. The ending is still really good, even if it is lifted from my favorite duck. Hop, look, and listen. I'm surprised it took them this long to make an elephant's trunk joke. Anyway, this is another one that's not especially heavy on the gags or the slapstick, but the energy as well as the natural absurdity of its premise goes a long way in making for a likable cartoon. 
And the ending is actually a decent subversion of what I thought the punchline would be. Whether or not it was intentional was anyone's guess, but I do have to say that my expectations were indeed subverted. Nothing but the tooth. This might be one of the more palatable Indian attack Looney Tunes cartoon of the bunch, due to the fact that the Indian that keeps trying to scout Porky is clearly a subversion of the typical savage Indian trope by being so pathetically ineffectual at being a threat. And in my opinion, it works. This is a fast-paced and entertaining cartoon with some fun bits of the Indian trying to get Porky to take his hat off. Some of them actually kind of creative, and it's actually a little bit crueler than I was expecting. The ending's pretty weak, but this is otherwise a real fun one. Buccaneer Bunny. In just two cartoons together, Yosemite Sam and Bugs Bunny have proven themselves to be such a dynamic duo. This is only amplified by the fact that the timing in this is just impeccable. And I can always appreciate a cartoon that literally takes five seconds just to do a quick slapstick gag and then move on like nothing happened. And the ending gag was genuinely unexpected and properly built up. Great stuff from start to finish. Bone Sweet Bone. This is Art Davis' attempt at directing a Chuck Jones-style cartoon with something that is cruel and devoid of mercy. But there's a right way to do cruelty in a cartoon, and this ain't it. Seriously, the dog's owner has got to be one of the worst human characters in the entire Looney Tunes catalog. Blaming your dog for something that you did, threatening to kill him if he doesn't correct the mistake, finding out about the mistake but deciding not to correct him because the exercise will do him some good, and then acting surprised when he comes back with the bone that you threatened to kill him over if he didn't bring it back? Seriously, what was that about? And why would you tell the audience before the dog sets out to correct his mistake and not have it be the ending punchline to the cartoon? The ending is when it should have been revealed to the audience, not right away. Because it deflates all the tension from the cartoon and it makes the entire events feel so pointless and devoid of intrigue or interest. This one's just broken at the seams. Bugs Bunny Rides Again. A nearly flawless bit of Wild West chaos. An energetic blast that never passes up the opportunity to tell a joke, and once again features some of that classic Sam and Bugs dynamic that makes their cartoons such a joy to watch. And I don't think the ending gets enough credit for being as unexpectedly subversive as it is. Just wonderful material, and has stayed a staple Looney Tunes cartoon for a very good reason. The Rattled Rooster. Another mid-cartoon from Art Davis. A lot of this feels like it should be funnier than it actually is. And I think it's largely because the comedic timing is just not hitting that well. When a joke does hit, it works fine, but that's only about half of them. And one gag is literally just an excuse to blatantly recycle animation. Although, I will admit, I didn't see the turn this cartoon took coming, so there is that. The Upstanding Sitter. The little baby chick in this one's kind of annoying... And it is also aggravating that Daffy never tries to tell this stupid kid that he's supposed to be babysitting him. But there's several great moments in here, like Daffy trying to reach underneath a hen, and pretty much all of Daffy's interactions with Spike were funny, most prominently the time Spike spanks him. This isn't a great cartoon, but it does everything more than adequately. The Shell-Shocked Egg This one's okay. Not really much to say about this one other than this cartoon is based on Booby Hatched, which is clearly a much better and funnier experience. Hair Devil Hair. They say when you send your main character into space that you tend to jump the shark. However, that's certainly not true in Bugs Bunny's case, especially since it gives him the opportunity to come across Marvin the Martian in his first appearance, who is such a hilarious character. Excellent slapstick, facial expressions, pitch-perfect timing, and one of the funniest ending punchlines of this group of cartoons so far. What's not to love? You Were Never Duckier. This is probably the first true appearance of Chuck Jones's greedy jerk Daffy. The Daffy that has almost no traces of his, well, Daffy personality. The one where nothing goes his way. And while I do enjoy Daffy's original personality a lot... I also kind of enjoy this side of his character as well. And in a series like Looney Tunes that is so episodic in nature, I can't see any reason why we can't have both depending on what's needed of him. 
Anyway, it was a weird idea to pair him with Henry Hawk, but it works. The chase scene near the end is a lot of fun, and the ending punchline, while predictable, is handled well enough. Do Re Mi Yao. I'm actually kind of surprised there weren't more cartoons with Heathcliff and Louie, because their dynamic and chemistry is impeccable. And the subversion of having the bird being the one to try to kill the cat is truly a breath of fresh air. I find myself returning to this one a lot, and it still makes me laugh, even after having seen this one multiple times. The final bit of the two main characters playing a game of hot potato with a stick of dynamite is truly excellent. A real underrated gem. Hot Cross Bunny. Here's one that I grew up with and watched all the time. And when I say all the time, I mean all the time. Like, I could probably recite this entire cartoon word for word. And it's just as good as I remembered. Of course, now that I'm an adult, there were several jokes that I actually picked up on that I didn't before. Like this genius Paul Revere joke. Anyway, this one's fast moving, with so many jokes crammed to the seven minutes, and Bugs' personality is pitch perfect in this one. The Pest That Came to Dinner. This one's just fun, and the pacing in this one is well handled. Nothing truly stands out here, but it remains consistently entertaining, and sometimes that's all a cartoon needs to be. Hair Splitter. This is another one that I grew up with. Bugs and Casbah, which, what in the world kind of a name is Casbah, fight over the same girl rabbit, and Bugs dresses up as her to try to scare his rival rabbit away, only to get sexually harassed for his trouble. This one's... okay. The Cupid gag is the only truly hilarious moment in this cartoon. Also, who puts a note on their front door saying they went out to go shopping? Is that a thing that people used to do? I don't know, maybe so, but that's just weird to me. Odor of the Day. Now here's a bizarre specimen of a cartoon, one that includes Pepe Le Pew, not only in a cartoon not directed by Chuck Jones, but with absolutely none of his trademark characteristics. Now, you might be tempted to say that, oh, this is just some generic skunk and this isn't meant to be Pepe, but no, officially, according to Warner Brothers, this is Pepe Le Pew. As an actual short, this one's pretty solid. The development of the dog losing his smell due to catching a cold so he couldn't smell Pepe was genuinely unexpected, but it felt organic. File this under good, but not great. The Foghorn Leghorn. It's weird that the opening credits were pushing for these cartoons to be starring Henry Hawk, when Foghorn Leghorn is clearly the funnier and more entertaining character. This one's a pretty fun twist on the Foghorn Leghorn formula, namely because I love this idea that Foghorn hates the idea of not being seen as a chicken so much that he keeps trying to convince a chicken hawk that he is indeed a chicken. That really is this kind of twisted Looney Tunes humor that they do so well, and this trunk gag is genuinely hilarious. A lad in his lamp. Bugs continues to be his fun self, including his delivery of the splitting hairs line. But the genie is a pretty annoying character. This is totally 100% watchable. The only interesting thing about this is the ending gag where Bugs wishes for a hair um. That's definitely adult. Daffy Dilly. A good solid premise for a chase cartoon, with the gags just never stopping and with some of the most impeccable slapstick timing so far. Got nothing more to say, it's just great fun. Kit for Cat. A good old-fashioned rivalry cartoon, and I love how the situation escalates as Sylvester's schemes keep failing and failing, and the kitten gets actively meaner in trying to get rid of him right back. The slapstick and pacing are both done very well. I especially love this gag where the light falls on top of Elmer, and Sylvester is standing in place with the screwdriver, and the look on his face is just so perfect, like he knows he's going to get blamed for it. Although, someone's going to have to explain to me how Elmer, who was somehow able to rent a house as big as this, was unable to find another home to live in. The Stupor Salesman. This is more of Daffy Duck just being the epitome of chaos and refusing to take no for an answer. But, you know, in a fun way. It's violent, it's bedlam, and it's enjoyable... Although, admittedly, the ending is way too abrupt. Riff Raffy Daffy. It's pretty good. Not great. Although the animation in this one, particularly on Daffy for some reason, just seems a little bit off. 
And even some of the slapstick feels a little bit too rubbery, like when Porky is taking swipes at Daffy with an axe. But it's always fun to watch Porky and Daffy go at it. In particular, this glue gag really stood out to me. And the ending is, if nothing else, unexpected. My bunny lies over the sea. You gotta love how Chuck Jones sets up that Angus and Bugs' disguise are going to be playing a game of golf, but then it completely abandons Bugs' disguise and doesn't even bother to explain it or comment on it. Also, Bugs entering another country and trying to impose his standards on their culture by telling a Scottish man that wearing a kilt is indecent? Hey, it turns out Bugs really is an American after all. Okay, all jokes aside, this one's fun. An above average Bugs outing with some creative golf gags. Scaredy Cat. What a treat this one is. This is a cartoon that I did like when I first saw it, but I just kept coming back to it and it only gets better and better the more times that I see it. If you were to ask me which Looney Tunes cartoon walked the tightrope between tension and comedy perfectly, I really don't think you could do better than this one. As par for the course, the comedy is definitely on point. Some of Sylvester's reactions and facial expressions are hilarious. And while the trope of somebody being in danger but not believing so when they're told can become tired if mishandled, but this is probably one of the best versions of this trope that I've ever seen somehow not going so far over the top that it becomes infuriating. But as a horror short, this one's also got some great elements to it, and I think it's because this one actually manages to keep a lot of what happens to the imagination. For instance, what on earth is the deal with this cult of mice? What is it they want? Why are they doing this? And did they actually go through with killing that cat at the start of the cartoon? And then there's the bit where Sylvester is sent underneath the kitchen and returns several hours later white as a sheet. What did he see? What on earth did the mice do to him? And why did they allow him to come back? Again, we don't get an answer, but I'm really glad they don't give us one because it allows our imagination to fill in the blanks. And it results in some actually creepy moments, but without getting in the way of the comedy. This is just incredible work, and it has slowly but surely worked up the ranks to becoming one of my favorite Looney Tunes shorts. Oh, and as a little piece of trivia, this is the first time that Sylvester's name is actually given as Sylvester. Wise Quackers. Oh boy, I get to talk about slavery again. Although, honestly, I don't really see the issue here because Elmer is supposed to be the antagonist, so I don't really see this one as being perceived as that offensive. Especially since, other than the ending gag, this one doesn't really have anything that could be construed as a race joke. Anyway, this one's definitely got some mean jokes, like this shaving joke and the aforementioned ending whipping gag, although the moment with the dogs does go on a bit too long. Hair do. While the bit where Bugs and Elmer pardon themselves as they're walking their way through the audience does go on a bit too long, the rest of this cartoon is great. From the opening hot and cold gag, to the numerous gags about Bugs tricking the ushers into thinking that Elmer's a masher, and the really cold and mean-spirited ending gag, this one is a ton of fun. Holiday for Drumsticks. Again, this is yet another one that I watched countless times as a kid. So I may have a bit of nostalgia goggles for it, but even still, I find this to be a really nice, entertaining, and cruel cartoon. It focuses on every single element just as long as it should, and it flows really nicely. The slapstick gags, while not done spectacularly, are done well, and it's got itself another wonderful ending punchline. This one even has a nice bit of foreshadowing, like when Thomas the turkey is being weighed and his fortune reads that he'll be served as a Thanksgiving meal, if you look closely, you'll see that Daffy's the one that actually steps on the scale, not Thomas. So it's actually hinting at Daffy's own fate at the end of the cartoon. That was actually genuinely clever. Awful Orphan. When I think of the Charlie Dog cartoons, this is the first one that always pops into my mind. Maybe because this is the first one that I saw. Several of these gags have actually stuck with me. Like the unexpected bit of Porky kicking the baby bassinet the opening bit of Charlie trying to pass himself off as God's gift to humanity, and the ending gag is easily the best of these Charlie Dog cartoons so far, where Porky accepts Charlie in the most deranged manner possible. Also, that has got to be the scariest I've ever seen Porky's face. Porky Chops. 
This is one that definitely gets the job done. The gags are just fine without really going above and beyond. The character of the squirrel isn't really that interesting of a character, but he's fine enough. And again, the animation is a little bit too rubbery for the slapstick to have as much impact as it should, but that still doesn't mean that it's done bad. This is another prime example of an adequate Looney Tunes cartoon. Mississippi Hair. The plot can at times feel like it's jumping around randomly, and this is another cartoon that does end too abruptly. But thankfully, almost every section of this cartoon is just fun. And Colonel Shuffle, while definitely so close to Yosemite Sam's personality that you wonder why he was even created at all, is a fun villain for Bugs to go up against. The card game gag and the dueling gag were both standout moments. Paying the Piper. Here's a fun little twist on the Pied Piper story. Although clearly the cats weren't doing that good of a job in the first place if the talent had to outsource the job of getting rid of the rats to someone else. Actually, now that I think of it, you could see this cartoon as being a metaphor for outsourcing jobs to people from out of town who can do a better job than your own citizens, and as a result they get jealous of the outsiders for taking their jobs and then going extreme measures to run them back to where they belong. You know what? I'm probably thinking way too deep about this one. Anyway, more of the typical mean Looney Tunes sense of humor. Done reasonably well, including one standout gag where it's revealed that Porky's sister works at a butcher shop. That gag came out of nowhere, but it got a big laugh out of me. Daffy Duck Hunt I greatly enjoy these kind of Daffy Duck and Porky Pig hunt cartoons, and this was actually the first one that I ever saw. So this one I will always have a soft spot for. But that's not to say that this is bad by any stretch. In fact, this one's sense of humor has a real sadistic mean streak to it. From the dog shoulder angel attacking the shoulder devil, to Porky threatening to decapitate the dog with an axe, to Porky, I guess, beating the crap out of the dog when he thinks that he stole the duck. Twice. Fun, classic cartoon. Rebel Rabbit. Bugs Bunny goes on a pointless war against literally everybody in order to prove that his species aren't in any way harmless, and goes way so far to prove his point that he gets the entire force of the United States government against him. It's a really funny idea, and every single joke showcasing whatever deviltry Bugs can get himself up to is hilarious, especially the utter absurdity of Bugs somehow managing to completely fill in the Grand Canyon. And the ending is the greatest pirate victory in the history of the entire Looney Tunes catalog. Mouse Wreckers. Otherwise known as one of the most sociopathic Looney Tunes cartoons in the entire collection. Due to Hubie and Birdie preemptively and viciously attacking Claude without giving him any kind of a chance to defend himself. To the point where he begins to question his own sanity. Gaslighting has certainly been used in Looney Tunes before, but this one feels particularly mean. Especially since Claude does literally nothing to the mice to warrant this kind of abuse. Maybe if they'd added a scene of him trying to catch them, that would make this a lot more excusable. Here's another one where I can definitely understand the mixed reaction to it. Because while the slapstick is actually done pretty decently, like this standout scene of Claude's tail being tied with the rope, and being dragged all across the house, it's actually kind of hard to laugh at somebody being bullied by a force that they can't see. And this is also another one where you can tell that the original ending was cut before its release because of how it's edited. It's not bad, it's just perhaps the one time the Looney Tunes cartoons went a touch too far. High Diving Hair. Just another classic. Features excellent chemistry between Bugs and Yosemite Sam, and all the ways that Bugs trick Sam into performing the high dive himself are creative, inventive, and hilarious. But in Sam's defense, why exactly did Bugs advertise Fearless Freep when he wasn't even there yet? Eh, still an awesome cartoon nonetheless. The Bee-Deviled Bruin. Entertaining slapstick watching a nasty person get precisely what's coming to them. Like I said before, the dynamic between the three bears is just great. And while the slapstick isn't impeccably timed here, this is still fun stuff. A simplistic premise with entertaining characters. Curtain Razor. A collection of gags that's just a bunch of animals auditioning for some kind of act. 
I wouldn't say any of them are really that funny, but this certainly isn't going to bore you or anything like that. But the timing just isn't really that strong here. The final gag involving the Fox's act that he can only do once would eventually be done a lot better and funnier in Showbiz Bugs. Bowery Bugs This is the tale of Bugs becoming so psychotic that he literally drives a man to suicide and then joyfully recounts it in great detail. Not that the man didn't deserve it, but still. This one has got to be Art Davis' best cartoon he's ever done. An excellent pace, Bugs being perfect, a fantastic antagonist who is equal parts intimidating and moronic, and a perfect ending gag. This is another Bugs cartoon that I don't think gets brought up enough as being one of his defining appearances. Mouse Mazurka. A passable chase cartoon, but that's really about all it is. Passable. Nothing is really done above average, and pretty much every one of these gags are ones that were done better elsewhere, so there's not much reason to watch this one unless you're a completionist. That being said, the ending is delightfully wicked and mean-spirited. Shame the rest of the cartoon couldn't match that same level, otherwise I would have liked this one a lot more. Long-Haired Hair The Definitive Bugs Revenge Cartoon I don't really know if I can add anything that so many others haven't already said. This works as both a classic cartoon with a series of wonderful gags, particularly its final sadistic punchline, and as a lampoon about the conflicts between older classical music and current popular music, which you could then extrapolate as being a battle of class warfare, with the opera singer Giovanni Jones representing the elites and the banjo playing bugs representing the common man. This is as rock solid as an anchor, and still entertaining even after countless rewatches. Henhouse House Henry. This one feels more like two cartoon plots that have nothing to do with each other, kind of schmooshed together for most of the runtime. Thankfully, both of them are good, and they do wind up tying together pretty well, including a hilarious slapstick ending gag. But I just wish they didn't feel so dissonant with each other to start with. Knights Must Fall. Definitely stands out as being not so great bugs after his string of impeccable cartoons, but this one's still fun enough and manages to elicit some solid laughs without doing anything spectacularly. Bad old putty tat. Another great early Sylvester and Tweety outing. Lots of classic gags like the badminton set piece and the ending bit of Tweety literally taking over Sylvester's body as if he were a locomotive. Funny stuff. The Grey-Hounded Hare. One of the rare instances of Bugs acting a lot dumber than normal, somehow mistaking what is clearly a mechanical rabbit for a real rabbit. Which, I don't know, it does seem out of character for him to make a mistake like that, even taking into account that these kind of cartoons don't follow any sense of continuity. It would be like Elmer being portrayed as an Einstein-type intellectual played straight. It just doesn't feel right. But as is, this one's okay. Got a few decent gags, including a pretty mean moment where Bugs sends all the dogs in the race to the city pound. Often an Orphan. Otherwise known as the cartoon that predicted 9-11. If only we'd been listening to Charlie Dog's warning about the towers falling. Anyway, the farm setting on this one helps this Charlie Dog cartoon stand out. And the cruelty in this one goes both ways, so it makes it a little bit more unpredictable. And while I still think Awful Orphan's ending punchline is funnier, this one is right up there in terms of meanness, but in a good way. The Windblown Hair Some traces of postmodernism in here, wherein the three little pigs actively seek to avoid their fate from the original fairy tale, and the wolf feels obligated to fill his role in the story, even resigning himself to his unsavory end, and the grandmother from Little Red Riding Hood almost feeling disappointed that the wolf's not going to eat her. But then Bugs comes along and decides to just insert himself into and disrupt the stories for his own purposes. The entire cartoon could be seen as a metaphor for the idea of screw fate or screw destiny, especially with regards to its ending. Really great. Doe for the Dodo. A colorized remake of Bob Clampett's excellent Porky and Wacky Land. Right down to reusing animation from both that and even Tin Pan Alley Cats. Frizz Freeling does an alright job imitating Bob Clampett's style, but honestly, it does feel like parts of this are too structured, not quite as chaotic as the original masterpiece. 
And the ending, while similar, there are differences that mean that the ending is not quite as mean or punchy as the original. It's still creative and fun, but at the same time, I can't really say that this one's justified in its existence. So I guess you could say that this is the best pointless cartoon of the Looney Tunes bunch. Fast and Furious. The first Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon. Now, these are cartoons that I grew up with a lot, and I always looked forward to watching them when they came on TV. Because of their very simple and brilliant setup, and because this was a series of cartoons that is nothing more than gags, they could move at whatever pace they needed to, depending on what was needed. So with these, this is all a matter of whether or not the gags in any given cartoon work consistently. And this one definitely does. By far the best one is where Wiley dresses up in a superhero outfit and somehow thinks that's going to grant him the ability to fly. Also, gotta love how the very first gag violates Chuck Jones's supposed nine rules for Roadrunner cartoons. Each Dawn I Crow. Another really mean one. And I especially like how the rooster gets the idea that Elmer Fudd is going to give him the axe from the narrator and how the narrator seems almost gleeful at the thought that the main character is going to be decapitated. Again, there is an argument that this one's got a clever little touch of postmodernism to it. Frigid Hair. A pretty fun Bugs cartoon if you can get past the unfortunate Eskimo design of the antagonist. Seriously though, that penguin is just so cute, especially when he started crying tiny little ice cubes. Also, Bugs, I really don't think Miami Beach is going to want you there after what you did in Rebel Rabbit. Swallow the Leader. This is basically a Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon, but with a generic cat and bird character. Bob McKimson's slapstick isn't quite as good as Chuck Jones's, but it's got its moments, like this ladder gag and the scene where the swallows attack and gang up on the cat. Bye Bye Bluebird. This is probably the closest I've ever ever seen to a cartoon coalescing the sadism of Chuck Jones's cartoons and the chaotic energy of Bob Clampett. Some of these gags like Porky jumping out of his skin are fantastic, and this image of Porky screaming and crying for help while a silhouette of a guillotine is being constructed in the background is some seriously disturbing stuff. Seriously, his blood-curdling screams are the stuff of nightmares. This is another one that I didn't give anywhere near enough credit on a first watch. And this cartoon ended up being Art Davis' last completed cartoon before his animation division was dissolved. And they went down from four directors to three. And yeah, that definitely stinks, especially since as a director, he'd shown a lot of potential and some definite improvement. At least he went out on a high note, and he did get to stick around as an animator for Frizz Freeling, so there is that. For sentimental reasons... This is usually seen as the definitive Pepe Le Pew cartoon. It's certainly the first one that pops into people's minds whenever you bring him up, and that's not without merit because this one did the formula the best. Not only does this include Penelope Pussycat's first appearance, who is definitely the best character to work off of Pepe, but it also features the absolutely classic gag at the end where the roles end up getting reversed and Pepe Le Pew gets a taste of his own medicine. And this cartoon has the courtesy to have not one, but two separate suicide gags. Because France. And it makes both of them really funny. Anyway, this cartoon is brimming with memorability, personality, and character. Paced perfectly, and the conversation between the two through a panel of glass, where their dialogue is pantomimed, is a great scene in a cartoon full of them. Like I said in the last video, Pepe is a character that can work if you know how to utilize him. And this one does a fantastic job at it. Hippity Hopper. So, this soft-spoken bulldog was also in Hop, Look, and Listen. I didn't even realize that this was the same dog that would later appear in Early Tibet. I wish this character appeared more often than he did because he's funny. Anyway, this is basically a slightly less funny version of Hop, Look, and Listen. Certainly not bad, but we're mostly treading over familiar ground here. Which is which? So, yeah, let's set aside the caricaturized design of the main villain for a second. As a cartoon in and of itself, this one's okay, if a bit too similar to Hiawatha's Rabbit Hunt. Some decent jokes in here, especially the ending gag where Bug actually decides to save the witch doctor 
after he gets swallowed by an alligator, and then coming back up with an alligator-skinned bag. There is also this bit where Bugs disguises himself as a stereotypical African villager. The blatant offensiveness of the gag was just so over the top and so unexpected that I hate to admit it actually somehow managed to elicit a laugh out of me, mostly out of sheer bewilderment. Bare Feet. Kind of a less funny version of the Bedeviled Bruin, right down to having the same ending punchline that you can see coming, and even repeating some of the gags. Although the gag where Pa is sent up into the air and ends up falling all night is a wonderful bit. I still enjoy the Three Bears' dynamic, so just having them in the cartoon makes it more than bearable. Also, why are there Bugs Bunny comics in a newspaper from 1928? Talk about a plot-destroying plot hole. Rabbit Hood. This is another Bugs cartoon that has a strong reputation, and for very good reason. The Sheriff of Nottingham is yet another fantastic villain for Bugs to go up against and the gags are fast, sharp, well-timed, and polished. This extremely delayed reaction from the sheriff after he accidentally constructs a house on the king's private garden is just perfect. And the final shot revealing that Robin Hood is the live-action Errol Flynn is also fantastic. A ham and a roll. You can't tell me that at least part of this cartoon was a way for the crew to let off some steam from any possible complaints they might have gotten that their work was too low-brow. Anyway, the slapstick in this one is okay, and it really is kind of weird how the dog doesn't really react to the bad things that happen to him. Really, what makes this one work okay is the chemistry between the Goofy Gophers, which is always a treat. And now we are officially leaving the 1940s behind and are headed straight into the 1950s. Home Tweet Home. This newspaper shot is genuinely terrifying. Anyway, this is a fairly standard Sylvester and Tweety chase cartoon. The gags are at times okay enough, but the standout moment by far is the bubblegum gag, which includes a pretty mean ending punchline. But still, it is weird that this cartoon introduces the nanny character, has her disappear for a while, only for her to be brought back for one shot. Yeah, that was weird. Hurdy Gurdy Hair. If Bugs really could have done this by himself in the first place, I'm not sure why he hired the chimp in the first place. This is a perfectly fine, if unremarkable, Bugs cartoon. The gorilla villain isn't particularly compelling, but the slapstick continues to be fun. Boobs in the Woods. False advertising based on the title aside, this one's great. Chaotic screwball fun. Every once in a while, we'll still get these Porky vs. Daffy cartoons, and when they do pop up, they're a real treat. And this one's no different. All you need is Daffy acting clinically insane, and Porky being the straight man to get some great comedic reactions and interactions. And the ending where Porky somehow manages to turn Daffy into a literal car motor, for some reason, always gets me. Particularly the choke gag. Mutiny on the Bunny. This one feels like two separate Bugs and Yosemite Sam cartoons, but I mean that as a compliment, because there's many gags and jokes crammed into this one. And it feels so bizarre to see Bugs actually on the defense against Yosemite Sam to begin with. The Lion's Busy. This one feels like an abrupt character change for Beaky Buzzard, going from a complete imbecile who couldn't even capture a fly to a devious mastermind who manages to walk circles around the lion. Not helping is that Mel Blanc's vocal performance of the character sounds nothing like Kent Rogers. That distraction is definitely unfortunate because this is actually a fun, mean-spirited idea for a cartoon. I know this was likely an attempt to reinvent the character, but despite a few amusing moments, they should have just let sleeping dogs lie. The Scarlet Pumpernickel. A fast-paced adventure short that acts as a parody of the Scarlet Pimpernel, and as a meta-commentary about the nature of screenwriting and pitching a film, as the story keeps escalating and escalating regardless of logic or reason. But maybe this thing moves at a bit of too fast of a pace. There's never a second for anything to really sink in or for you to catch your breath, and some of the plot developments go by so quickly that it'll leave you with whiplash. This is one of those that would have benefited from being stretched out, possibly even up to a 22-minute special. But yeah, the stuff that's in here is great. Homeless Hair. 
another Bugs cartoon that I know inside, outside, backwards, and sideways due to growing up with it. It's always fun to watch Bugs engage in a fight with someone who started it first. And what makes this one so interesting is that Bugs barely has to do anything to win this time around, showing that he's starting to become self-aware of his own invincibility. Strife with Father So you mean to tell me that a cartoon where Beaky Buzzard was actually devious and intelligent, and a cartoon where Beaky was stupid were being produced at exactly the same time? Honestly, that kind of makes the Lions Busy feel even more pointless with his inclusion. Anyway, even though Mel Blanc is still not as talented at voicing Beaky as Kent Rogers, it is still nice to see Beaky back to his own self, and it supplies some good old-fashioned slapstick laughs. The Hypochondra Cat One of the more famous Hubie and Birdie and Claude cartoons, and for good reason, mostly because of the surreality of Claude's dream sequence. This one feels very similar to Mouse Wreckers in terms of cruelty, whereas the two mice are really cruel to someone who honestly doesn't really deserve it, but for some reason this one seems a lot more palatable than that cartoon. I'm also not sure how I feel about the ending. On one hand, it is pretty abrupt, almost like it's missing an ending punchline, but on the other hand, it is pretty unexpected at how abrupt it is, and you get the added benefit of imagining what happened next. Big House Bunny features some of the meanest slapstick jokes I've seen in a Bugs cartoon to date, like when Yosemite Sam gets hanged at the gallows and when he gets electrocuted via the electric chair. Maybe you could also make the argument that the moment where Bugs and Sam switch clothing is making a comment about how the only difference between the prisoners and the guards are the clothes they're wearing, but I highly doubt that was the filmmaker's intention at the time. Anyway, another great Bugs cartoon with impeccable timing and a real mean streak. The Leghorn Blows at Midnight Something feels off with the barnyard dog's voice in this cartoon. Don't really know why. Anyway, a pretty decent Foghorn Leghorn cartoon, wherein he feels like more of a jerk than usual. It's enjoyable, but it doesn't really stick out. His Bitter Half The parts of the cartoon of Daffy dealing with his nag of a wife are actually pretty funny. The parts where he has to deal with her Aunt Rambunctious son are less so. So I guess you could say about half of this cartoon works. Also, I guess the Hayes office didn't care about portraying unhappy or abusive marriages just so long as they were in a cartoon. An Egg Scramble The plot of this one feels kind of random, but not necessarily in a good way. The ending where Prissy gets caught up in a gangster shootout doesn't really feel, for lack of a better word, earned. It's still got some decent gags and moments, and it's definitely not an unpleasant watch, but this is the definition of a cartoon that exists. What's Up Doc? A pretty entertaining story explaining the origins of where Bugs Bunny came from. Feels like a product of the time in the sense that it contains pop culture references of the era, and of how showbiz operated back in the 40s and 50s. And I don't know, it just feels kinda nice knowing that Elmer Fudd was actually how Bugs got his big break, and then he willingly took a step down after Bugs became a bigger star than him. This one's not very gag-heavy, but it's just a pleasant experience from start to finish. Also, this is proof that Bugs was the master of the toy piano before Schroeder. All aboard! Pretty fun for the most part. The gags do start to get a little bit predictable in this one. There are some truly great moments in here, especially at the start, like this bit where the dog and Sylvester have a fight inside their kennels. Eight Ball Bunny Someone must have realized that they struck gold with the penguin in frigid hair, because he's back and he's just as cute as ever. It's actually a surprisingly sweet story of Bugs going above and beyond the call of duty of trying to get a penguin back home, which is a very different kind of Bugs than we're used to seeing, and it adds a level of dimension to his character. Also, it's pretty funny that this cartoon constantly makes references to Humphrey Bogart's career slump, when less than two years later he'd wind up winning the Academy Award. It's Hummer Time. There's more than a few characters I've wondered why they didn't attempt to make a lot more cartoons with as a pair, and this cat and dog are right at the top of my list, as I believe they only had one more cartoon together after this. I just love how the dog has all sorts of punishments lined up for the cat, just in case he disturbs him when he's resting, 
and that this has happened with such a frequency that the cat knows exactly what the punishment he's about to get is going to be, so much so that he's even given them names. And the slapstick here is pretty fun. Although, to be fair, the cat was pretty much asking for it by the time the cartoon comes to an end. Golden Yeggs. You gotta give Daffy Duck some credit. It takes a special set of cojones to act like a snobbish jerk and give an attitude to a group of gangsters and criminals. Sure, it doesn't last, but at least an attempt was made. I also like the little detail that the criminals actually did pay for Daffy, as evidenced by the cash in Porky's hand. I don't know why, I just think that's a neat little bit of attention to detail. Anyway, this one's interesting because I doubt you'd be able to predict where this cartoon was going on your first watch, but instead it escalates it beautifully, and the ending punchline is just perfect. So cruel and hilarious. Hillbilly Hair. This is another entertaining Bugs cartoon. I don't really have much to say other than this one works. The gun gags at the beginning are the real highlight, but the cartoon never does come close to surpassing its strong opening. Dog Gone South I guess Charlie Dog decided to leave poor Porky Pig alone and decided to exploit a southern plantation owner's ignorance for his own personal benefit. This is really good. I especially love how Charlie dresses up the southerner's dog Belvedere to make it look like he's a Yankee lover. The sign he had him carry, the North Forever, it's just so brilliantly on the nose. The Ducksters. I grew up watching game shows, so this one is right up my alley. Also, I have no idea why anybody would willingly choose to go on this game show. It's just so demented and mean. Anyway, this cartoon is just so demented and mean. And this is one of the quintessential pairings of Porky and Daffy, including one of, if not the best, Porky turning the tables on Daffy ending for him, basically all but outright stating that Porky murders him. It's paced perfectly, has hilarious facial expressions, and is able to elicit laughs just from the delivery of lines that shouldn't elicit laughs. Just wonderful. A Fractured Leghorn. The cat from It's Hummer Time returns, only this time paired with Foghorn Leghorn. It's a pairing that works just fine, although it is a little strange to see Foghorn in a cartoon without either the Barnyard Dog or Henry Hawk. The highlight has to be Foghorn Leghorn waiting under the water for the cat to use the worm for bait, and then berating the cat for taking too long so that he could steal it. Bunker Hill Bunny. Another great Bugs vs. Yosemite Sam cartoon. More ludicrous, hilarious, and mean set pieces with its fair share of middle fingers being directed towards physics. The gag that gets points for the utter absurdity of it is the flame on the gunpowder chasing after Sam. Although the image of Bugs just sitting on top of a gunpowder keg, casually eating a carrot is just peak Bugs, really just goes to show how blasé and little of a crap Bugs actually gives. Alright, that is it. Part 6 is now finito. And once again, this collection of cartoons was an improvement over the last batch, although the increase was incredibly minor. Like I mentioned last time, the crew has definitely found their groove, although admittedly Bob Clampett's absence was definitely felt at the start. And Art Davis had to grow a little bit, but thankfully there was really only one bad cartoon of the group this time around. Incredibly easy to get through, although there weren't really a ton of surprises because most of the great cartoons in here are actually already quite well known. But, of course, in the next hundred cartoons, we're going to see what is perhaps the most iconic Looney Tunes cartoons of all time, the entirety of Chuck Jones' Hunting Trilogy, and another cartoon that, I don't know, maybe you've heard of it before, called Duck Amuck. In terms of what new characters are coming up, we have Granny making her debut, Mark Anthony and Pussyfoot, Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog, and Speedy Gonzalez... Th that... That does not look like Speedy Gonzalez. Oh, I can't wait to talk about this cartoon. And I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. As always, the links to part 1 through 5 are in the description below. And if you want to be notified of when part 7 comes out, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Anyway, have a good day. And I'll see you next time.